Yeah, okay. Hi, guys. Um, just a little bit, little bit about me, about this talk, what we're going to do here today. Um, I'm currently freelancing, doing a lot of consultancy and de um, custom development work. Um, I'm a Lucene.net committer. I've been working on with Lucene back uh, for a couple of years now. Um, I've been maintaining uh, the C Lucene project, with, which is the C++ um, port for, of Lucene, and then, uh, which is now dead, and now a Lucene.net project. And uh, this talk is basically some view, some bird's eye view of Elasticsearch plugins. So I've been working with Elasticsearch for about two years now, um, and we've been doing some really nice, interesting stuff with Elasticsearch. We've come to points where we had to extend it um, using various mechanisms, and basically that's the talk where I'm going to show you um, where you can extend it, how you can do that, when you want to do this, and, and so on. Um, so this talk, because it's only 40 minutes, is going to be a very high level view of what you can do, how you can do that. I'm not going to dive too much into uh, details, but I am going to give references and uh, basically where you can uh, take this uh, from. Um, yeah. So the agenda is basically I am talking about the integration points where we where, where you can integrate with Elasticsearch with Lucene. Um, then I'm going to give you some showcases where you can do that or how I did that for special uh, for certain uh, scenarios, and then talk about some gotchas when you write your plugin or when you integrate um, what what to watch for, and uh, then I hope we can get to do some Q and A. So. Looking at Elasticsearch on a high level, um, no offense, but Elasticsearch, generally speaking, can be thought of as, a, as an HTTP server on top of Lucene. So what you can see here is basically the Elasticsearch server, and within that Elasticsearch server, we have Lucene. So this part here is a bit small. We are going to zoom in in just a second. But Elasticsearch server basically just takes in REST, respond, uh, REST requests, send back um, responses, and you can either do indexing or querying, and those um, uh, commands or um, requests are going to be delegated to a Lucene index. That Lucene index has some logic happening within it, and that logic um, looks a bit like this. Um, so we have um, requests searching or indexing coming in, and then you have the query parser, you have the analysis chain, you have the indexing, you have the search parts where Lucene actually does its, its thing. And then in the bottom you have the Lucene index itself, the actual files. Now, um, the integration, those things that Lucene does can actually be integrated with. So let's start with the most um, maybe not interesting example, which is the query parser. So when you send a request, that request, that search request can be um, a, basically a query string. Now the official, the official um, recommendation is usually not to use um, a query string, basically because the query parser that comes with Lucene can throw exceptions, can do um, stuff that you don't really want it to do. Um, so you can either send, uh, use some, uh, some other query types which that Elasticsearch provides, or you can implement your own, your own query parser. So there is actually a, sim a simple query parser, I think it's called, um, that's uh, um, sort of new to Lucene as well, um, that is um, a custom query parser that actually takes a very relaxed syntax and it doesn't throw. Um, and basically, if you want to write your own query parser, you can do that, and then you basically integrate that query parser within, within Elasticsearch. You tell Elasticsearch that whenever a query string um, query comes into Elasticsearch, it should use that query parser, and then you're pretty much done. Um, I think there is no way to actually have multiple query parser implementations uh, lying side by side, so if you provide a query parser, you basically replace the existing one, but that's the most, I think, simple um, integration point we can, uh, we can talk about. How you do that, we'll touch that um, in the end of the talk. And then we have the analysis chain. Now, whenever you have indexing coming in or searches, certain searches coming in, um, for example, query strings or 
um, the query string queries, or you have ma the match family uh, queries coming in, they are going to go through the analysis chain. Now, what is the analysis chain? It's basically uh, probably the most important part of Lucene. Um, just to demonstrate why, so if we have um, you know, one line of text, the analysis chain is going to actually take care of tokenization and uh, token filtering for you. So you have um, that string, that line of string, of one string line, line of text. It's going to be tokenized into multiple tokens. That's the first part of the analysis chain. And then you have the second part where you can have multiple filters doing multiple um, operations on top of the, the entire token stream or each individual uh, token on itself. So you can remove tokens, you can add tokens, you can manipulate tokens. So that's one example. Um, there is another example, for example, that does some uh, uh, ASCII normalizations, lower casing. Um, and usually the analysis chain is going to match from both sides of the indexing and searching. So you, you are going to index this line of text, this line of text, you're going to have multiple terms in the index, and when you query, you're basically probably going to query on only multi, on only single um, items, terms, and that is going to go through the same process, and that basically ensures you're going to get the results that you're looking for, or the documents um, that were indexed. Sometimes, however, you, you, want, you will want to actually use different analyzers for the search part and the indexing part. There are good uh, samples for that as well, so keep that in mind. Um, and there is also sometimes when you actually want um, different tokenization behaviors than what's provided. So um, some analyzers, some to analyzers in Lucene or some tokenizers, to be more exact, are going to, for example, to preserve uh, email addresses. Some will not. Um, wh whatever the behavior that you want um, can actually change between corpuses and, and query types. And to, to just finalize my case, um, since we're in Berlin, so you have this uh, um, way of actually combining multiple words together, so you do actually want to provide an analyzer that can understand your language, your corpus, uh, your, the whatever searches your users may want to do. This is why, basically, you'd want to write your own analyzer. So there are some analyzers that come binded, uh, bundled with Lucene. Um, these are the most basic ones. Um, and then you have um, the ability to actually construct your own analyzer um, without doing actually any actual code uh, work um, using just index settings. So it's a J one JSON document that you put with, as a settings uh, Within your uh, within your Elasticsearch cluster or uh, metadata cluster, and that's how you can take token filters or tokenizers, which are the two steps that we have shown, and, uh, and construct an analyzer out of them. So an analyzer basically is constructed of one tokenizers and one tokenizer and multiple token streams or none at all. Um, and that's your choice what to do. So this is one way you can integrate with Elasticsearch, constructing an analyzer out of those, uh, those constructs. And that's without doing any coding at all. Um, that's fe that feature here, by the way, is new in Elasticsearch. Uh, in, my, my, in my opinion, it's, it's some sort of a game changer in, in terms of how you can actually do really interesting stuff with uh, uh, with basically with Lucene, with full text searches, look it up. Um, but you can actually go and write your own analyzer. So if, for example, you want to have a tokenizer, or you want to have um, token filters, or you want to have the whole deal that does not, uh, you then don't have that in Lucene currently, or you don't have that in, uh, in Elasticsearch, or in any other plugin does not allow you to do that, you will probably go and write this for yourself. So I mentioned it's very language dependent and very corpus dependent. So here's a, an example of a plugin I wrote, which actually takes a, a big problem in the, in the search uh, world, uh, which is the Hebrew language. Um, it's basically, you cannot really index and search on, on Hebrew texts using 
any currently available um, tools. And this is an Elasticsearch plugin that I wrote. It's open source, you can go and look, look up the code, see how I do things there, which basically gives you token filters and it gives you a custom tokenizer that lets you um, index and search Hebrew properly. Um, there is some gotcha here, we'll get to that uh, in the end. Basically, I'm using um, an, a dictionary. And that dictionary, I need to have it available, and that uh, tends to, to present some problems, and we are going to look at that in just a bit. So going back to the Lucene diagram for a second. So we just talked about the analysis chain. Now, once we have constructed a, a query out of a query string or whatever other query that went or didn't go through the analysis chain, we're not going to perform the actual search uh, using that query object internally in Lucene. Now, here is, here is probably where the most of the extension points are. So let's start with scripting. So you can issue a lot of uh, queries and, and have filters and have uh, custom scoring and do facets or aggregations, do a lot of, a lot of those stuff, but you might get to a point where you're trying to do something uh, and maybe your model doesn't allow you to do exactly what you want. Or maybe some um, scoring, you, know, some kind, you need to do some custom scoring or you need to do um, custom uh, filtering and so on. And that's where the scripting engine of Elasticsearch comes into play. Um, generally speaking, it's, it's pretty slow. So it, it works nicely and it, it is quite performant but you don't want to rely on that um, once you grow too big or you have uh, many uh, requests coming in. And that's something to keep in mind. You can definitely start uh, working with that. You can definitely write something working and working well with that. But at some point, you're going to notice um, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't take all you want it to take. And that's where you should start looking for alternatives. So basically, the scripting in Elasticsearch is, is based on multiple uh, scripting engines. Um, the one used by default is MVL. You have uh, Groovy, you have Python. There are multiple um, other scripting languages, scripting engines you can use. Um, you can obviously write your own scripting engine if for some reason you want to do that. Um, but again, it's just a scripting engine and um, that's uh, something to take note of. Um, and at some point, you're going to get to a point where you want to make this more performant. There are two ways to do that. One is to go the native scripts route, meaning you'll be writing um, some sort of a plugin that basically does the actual, um, the actual work for you, but it's written in Java and it's actually compiled and, being, uh, and Elasticsearch uses us as, uh, as a native code or native Java JVM code. Or you can go and in, in your, in if, if in your case it makes sense to actually extend Elasticsearch to do using some custom actions, um, you might want to go that route. Although, as we will see, it, it has its own pitfalls. Continuing, continuing on that point, so basically if you want to do custom scoring or if you want to have an ability to search your corpus and get results ranked in a different way. So you can integrate custom similarity, which Lucene by default gives you as I, a TF-IDF, but you, there are other, other ways to do that, or for example, the BM25 or the DFR. So you want to maybe um, integrate other similarity, similarity implementations. That's really an expert, uh, expert feature. Use it only if you know what you're doing. What is important, I think, is the function score query, which Brita just uh, previously talked about, and that's a really powerful feature. That's something that you should really look into if you want to do um, custom scoring um, and reflect results, the results order, based on really complex, uh, complex logic. But again, that's basically a script um, and all that comes with it. Okay, next point in the Lucene integration part. So you ha we have the indexing part. And it, this, uh, this next point is actually going to affect also searching. 
So in Lucene.4, we, we Lucene 4, sorry, we um, there there has been uh, a new feature added. It's called Codex. Basically, it means um, it's some sort of an abstraction layer on how the Lucene indexes are going go, um, getting uh, written into disk and how they are loaded back again. Um, and again, expert feature. There are some optimizations that you can achieve by actually switching codecs. So you define a codec uh, basically like that. You put a codec definition, or you use an, an existing codec definition, or, which already you can already have. And then in the mapping of your index, you're going to tell Elasticsearch that this field needs to use this codec. And this is basically, again, an expert feature how you can uh, improve performance because, for example, some fields make more sense to load them up at once and keep them in memory, and some fields do not. And that's what Codex lets you, let you do. Um, finishing up on the Lucene part, um, we've been seeing how the inner parts of Lucene can be integrated with. Again, we're going to see how, can, how we can actually do that in, in the end. But let's, for now, treat Lucene as a black box. So we have requests coming in, and we want to just pass them to Lucene, get back the results. And now let's look at what we can extend on that part uh, that is Elasticsearch that basically manages Lucene indexes for us. Now, what I have in this slide is basically re um, REST, um, query, REST uh, requests coming in, and I'm basically assuming it's either indexing or queries, but that's not true, right? So in Elasticsearch, we have um, uh, stats and management and um, metadata, cluster metadata that we can uh, manage. So I, d I left it out of the slide, but obviously Elasticsearch has that as well. So that's a zoom out. Let's now look at what Elasticsearch can be extended with. So the first thing that we're going to look at now is how once we have one or multiple Lucene indexes in our installation, how we can control how they are moved around. So we have one Elasticsearch cluster, which is one or more servers. And assuming we have more than one server, we now want to decide how to allocate those shards, those Lucene indexes, between those, uh, those servers. So that's basically where shard allocation control comes into play. So by default, Elasticsearch allows you, gives you quite a lot of power. So you can, you can tell an index that you want it on a specific server by IP or by tag, or specify a bunch of them using tags, um, using blacklist, whitelist approaches. Or you can, you can fine tune things like how many uh, shards I want on a specific node, how many shards of a specific index I want uh, for on a specific node. Um, I, we can, you can also tell it to consider uh, disk space. Um, for example, I want to make sure that disk only has um, 20 gigabytes used or only has, uh, al always has um, this amount of space uh, free, etc. Now, that's all. Um, already implemented for you, and all you have to do is basically play with uh, with some settings. Uh, again, you either um, using the JSON, using JSON the settings, uh, the index settings, or you can go and change the Elasticsearch YAML for most of that. Um, you may want, in some cases, uh, implement your own shard allocation logic. But that's very, very uh, dangerous, basically because a lot of times the sharding allocation st strategy or the deciders that are in play, there is generally more than one in play. So you want to make sure that your uh, decider, that you, if you decide to implement one, um, I don't know, taking into account RAM usage, for example, um, if you cannot do that using tags or rack IDs or whatever, and you decide to do this using your own custom code, make sure it plays really, really nicely. Again, super expert feature. Um, one other interesting, um, can you see that? Sorry about that. Um, one really interesting feature that I think worth noticing is that Elasticsearch, again, is basically some, it's, it's, it's an HTTP server. And it's a distributed one. So once you have um, Elasticsearch deployed, you, and if you have a plugin that actually gives you a REST endpoint, you can basically go and approach the cluster to perform that for you. Now, that, that can have 
multiple usages. Um, one is, for example, to have your custom logic implemented for search or whatever, and then you can expose that to non-Java uh, consumers because Java, Java clients you basically usually don't use the, the REST API, they're using the um, custom uh, serialization uh, protocol of Elasticsearch on, on another port. Um, but non-Java clients are going to communicate with Elasticsearch using the REST API. So if you have, if you have implemented your own logic, um, for example, custom search or custom whatever, then uh, integrating with Lucene, for example, so you may want to implement that REST endpoint to, to expose it to consumers. One other um, uh, use case, for example, uh, which I found uh, actually useful, um, when, for example, I implemented that custom Hebrew search, so I actually exposed an HTTP endpoint that lets me, let, lets me pick into the dictionary that is being used. Now, because that's basically an HTTP server, I can implement whatever HTTP endpoint that I want in the cluster and basically expose uh, business logic out of that cluster as well, and that can prove very, very useful. Side note, always put Elasticsearch behind a proxy, and that way you basically protect yourself from a lot of stuff. But the, well, I'm saying that to make sure that um, that advice doesn't go to exposing your website or whatever out of Elasticsearch, just you know, internal um, business logic that you want distributed. Um, what's been shown here is actually very simplistic code. Um, when, once you have a request coming in, you're going to need to parse it, then you need to process it, do whatever uh, logic you have to do, and then build back the response and send it back. Now, speaking about the REST endpoints, or speaking about the uh, REST capabilities of Elasticsearch, we can have multiple transports uh, supporting that. So by default, Elasticsearch uses the HTTP, uh, HTTP for transports. You can, you can use Apache Thrift, you can have uh, multiple other transports, and Elasticsearch already has, as plugins at least, you can uh, actually install more transports. Some, uh, I, I don't actually uh, know why they would be used like, uh, like they're used. For example, the 0MQ one, uh, I'm not quite sure of the use cases, but apparently people have, have found use cases for that. And uh, that you can do that. You can actually even write your own transport and, and use that. So you, all of uh, Elasticsearch um, REST API basically can be exposed via different protocols. The Thrift protocol, for example, is one that's often being used to speed up uh, over the default HTTP uh, protocol. So let's, let's talk about uh, one use case that we had. Um, we, were de we deployed Elasticsearch and basically we use it for search and in one project and we had a lot of uh, search action going on, but we also need to percolate. Now percolation basically means an alerting system of, on top of Elasticsearch that makes sure that whenever you have new document coming in, alerts will fire for um, a list of stored queries that you have in your system. Now the, that back in the day, I think it was a year ago, um, Elasticsearch didn't have a distributed percolator, and we also wanted to make sure that that percolator um, is highly optimized to our use cases because we had a lot of documents coming in regularly. So what we did is basically we took the Elasticsearch, the actual Elasticsearch percolator, we pulled it out, we put it in, a, in our own jar file, made our optimizations to it, optimizations including highlighting. Again, back in the day where the percolator didn't have highlighting, um, we had a lot of uh, query optimizations, so we basically filter out a lot of queries based on their language, stuff like that. Um, we added a lot of logs because we really, really needed to understand when an alert comes uh, is going to be fired, where, where, when it didn't, we needed to track that. So we did a lot of customizations, and then we basically compiled it again and pushed it as a plugin. Um, but that's a very easy to make plugin, because basically all we had to do is take some um, existing code from Elasticsearch, compile it, and then um, pull, pull it into, uh, make Elasticsearch detect it, and then fire it and let it run. And again, we're going to see how to do that in, in the end of the talk. 
Sometimes you really don't have any other choice but to dig deeper into the API, and that's what happened to us here. Um, basically, this is, uh, we called it the bubble plugin because in the end you would have a vi visualization which looks like a lot of bubbles. But uh, what, it, what this is, is basically a similar functionality to what you have now as a significant terms uh, facet, only it's, we did this uh, over a year ago, and it has a lot of uh, added logic within that. So it's n-grams, it supports n-grams and a lot of other stuff. And basically, that, that, that emerged from the fact that if we wanted to have this in a distributed and a fast way, we really had to dig, to dig, to dig deep into Elasticsearch. So the way this works, basically, you issue a query, you get back, and for example, 1,000 results or uh, 1,500 results, depends on the accuracy of, of the representation that you're looking for. And then once you've got the results, you're going to go uh, uh, one by one, and you're going to do some sort of parsing and some sort of, uh, of uh, computations on top of the text, on the actual text that is coming back. Now, some documents, that's been done on, on, by scraping uh, social networks and websites and blogs. Some, some content can be very, very large. So if we were querying Elasticsearch, which is a distributed uh, search engine, and you wanted to get back those results and then go one by one and do this pricey calculation, that would basically mean you'd have, uh, you cannot scale. So each such uh, operation, each, each such uh, logic is going to take you quite, quite a few minutes to perform and think what happens, for example, when you have multiple uh, people doing this all together. Now, even for one customers, where, one customer waiting for a couple of minutes for this uh, graphic to show, is a bit of a, of a killer. So what we did, we, dig, we, uh, we dug into Elasticsearch and basically implemented our own search uh, engine. So in, instead of um, actually getting back the results and doing stuff, we actually took the code from Elasticsearch, it does search and returns back the results, and instead of returning back results, we did all the logic of the text processing on that on that phase. Now, what that allowed us to do is actually have that, um, that calculation or that computation, text processing, being done on each and every shard in parallel, and then instead of returning back all of the documents, we would have gotten, gotten from this plugin just multiple buckets saying, okay, this is a significant term and this is a significant term, and those are the, the counts, and then the master node accepting that request would have just merged those buckets together and uh, gave us this result back, which, and then we could have uh, generated that graphic. Now, that's a very, very, very um, tough to do. Uh, it broke with every minor version because we dug so deep into the Elasticsearch core, but back in the time, we didn't really have any other way of doing that. Also, just you know, debugging this was a really, really, re really big pain. We would basically just write a lot of uh, debugging or traces everywhere, and then use a lax, uh, sorry, logstash and some Kibana to actually understand the timeline of what's going on. Very, very painful. So, going back to Elasticsearch again, just an HTTP server. So why not just serve static content out of it? And that's where site plugins come in. And th those probably are the plugins that most of you are already familiar with. So Kibana, Marvel, um, uh, Big Desk, and uh, all of those and many others are basically plugins that are just static HTML files um, or static files in general that you can just tell Elasticsearch to give, give, give you back. Once you get them back, um, you can just communicate with the cluster, use the, uh, with them, or maybe sometimes you can just serve files which are not related to Elasticsearch at all. And again, don't use Elasticsearch to serve your website. Don't expose Elasticsearch um, to the outside world. Um, some more advanced stuff includes discovery. Um, basically, how Elasticsearch um, finds other nodes within the cluster. Um, so my personal recommendation is never to use multicast in a uh, in production environment. Um, rarely are the cases where I've actually seen used to that. Um, you usually you would want to be familiar with your servers and then uh, use unicast. Sometimes during development, mostly it's not possible, and then you want to have 
multicast, basically auto detection and auto forming of the cluster. This is where you use dis uh, the discovery mechanisms, uh, which the Zen uh, discovery, the basic one, does automatically for you, but sometimes it needs some help uh, with regards to, uh, to various cloud uh, implementations. Um, so there, those are already implemented for you, the, the, the major cloud. Uh, the major, major clouds already implemented. Um, and there is also the Zookeeper plugin, which I think worth worth mentioning, even though it's a bit out of date now. Um, it's a way for you to actually make sure that you don't get partial partitions, uh, which I know is currently being worked on, but um, worth noting. Um, the late, recent uh, versions of Elasticsearch um, give you the ability to do snapshot and restore functionalities um, to various locations, um, including file system, various clouds, um, and basically, again, all the uh, major cloud implementations are already implemented for you, um, and, but you can roll your own. And then once you, you do that, you basically can restore and update, um, sorry, snapshot and restore from whatever other implementation you wish. Um, let's talk about rivers for a second. Um, rivers are being widely used. Um, ba rivers is basically a way for Elasticsearch to digest data, meaning if you have an Elasticsearch running, so you're going to have some sort of a plugin with it within that Elasticsearch instance that is going to di digest data, for example, from queuing servers, from, I don't know, scraping the web, and whatever other implementations. There are so many implementations out there. Um, Oh, oh, river plugins are obsolete or about to get obsolete. Um, you should, as a general note, um, not do that. Now, the idea behind rivers, I don't know, it may, it may appeal for some. So you have some logic that happens automatically to index data for you. Uh, the problem with that is that uh, this is very prone to failure. Uh, as a general rule, I would usually recommend people to use the pool-based ingestion rather, sorry, push-based rather than pool-based. So river is pool-based, is I'm here, just give me everything. Push-based, or I, I, I like calling this shoveling, is basically I'm here, I know my cluster is there, and then I can push data to that cluster. Now, when you use the push-based, you can scale out the pushing the shoveling operation. So, or you can, if you have a backlog, you can catch up on that and so on. With rivers, it's very, 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 it's more, uh, it's more complex than that. Now, you can use Logstash. There is something that's called Stream2 ES, which I found actually very useful to, to play with it a bit or uh, sometimes extend, sometimes uh, just demo stuff or quickly come up with, uh, with a shoveling mechanism. Uh, which you should really look into. Whatever you do, I recommend you don't use the rivers. Um, yeah, sorry about that. Um, so let's let's wrap wrap up a bit, a bit. So we have multiple plugin types in Elasticsearch. Um, some of them are um, Lucene parts, which you can play with, you can uh, replace, um, and some are some sort of Elasticsearch functionalities that you can either enhance or just add your, add your own. And installing plugins, and once you have a plugin which has to be a jar, uh, basically JVM bytecode, um, it, can, it can be a side plugin, but again, it has to be uh, within a jar. And basically, you install it um, using either manually, basically unzipping it into uh, the plugins folder of Elasticsearch, or using the existing tool that will let you do this, uh, that we, it will do this for you. So you can go and fetch using the tool um, from, uh, from GitHub, from Maven, uh, from, uh, from uh, how it's called, Maven, the open source Maven repository. So you can use Maven repositories or GitHubs, or you can just point it to a URL and install from that URL if you cannot publish to GitHub or, uh, or Maven. Once you have those plugins installed, you can get information about those plugins uh, either using the, that tool or you can go uh, to the cluster and ask it for using the node info API. You can get back a list of nodes and whatever plugins are installed on them. Once you get the, that info, you can obviously remove plugins uh, if need be. So 
when do you want actually to write uh, plugins? Um, don't be this guy. Don't come and say, okay, I have a problem, let's write a plugin. Um, that's really, try to ignore the urge to write uh, plugins uh, that may be interesting, but it, it can get very quickly, very uh, painful. Uh, that's the next slide we'll see some pain, pain points. Um, the defaults are pretty good, and you can do a lot with the scripting mechanism. You can do a lot with whatever else there is in Elasticsearch. The aggregations frame framework just made a lot of faceting much more easier. Um, but sometimes you really don't have any other choice. So when you do need to have some distributed behavior done, um, and you cannot really achieve that by any of the Elasticsearch uh, ways of, of doing that, like for example, the bubble example that I just gave you, this is where you go and do this distributed, uh, sorry, this is where you go and write a plugin. Or when we, you need to distribute some, uh, some REST functionality, or when it's just a site plugin. But other than that, most of, um, the, most of the work of writing a plugin doesn't really work that, that doesn't really worth that. And what is this work? Um, that's, I would say it's basically four things. So the first thing is really maintenance. So once you've written code, you really need to maintain it. You need to make sure it runs. We need, you need to make sure it operates well. And again, it needs to operate well within the, the rest of the infrastructure. Um, and the deeper that you go into the Elasticsearch API, the most likely it is to, to break very, very soon. Once you have a plugin, it's, it's a lot of times really pain to actually deploy that and actually uh, version that. Although there are ways to overcome that using Puppet, for example, it is still a, a very difficult sometimes to keep up with versioning. I mentioned auxiliary data, meaning dictionaries, for example. So if you have an analyzer that actually wants to load the dictionary and use the Elasticsearch mechanism for that, again, syncing that, those, that data, if it needs to, uh, to be on, on the file system and not on some cloud, that's going to be challenging. Um, there is an open, uh, open ticket on Elasticsearch, Elasticsearch repository, um, for maybe exposing that and allowing analyzers or plugins to load data out of um, um, the document store that is Elasticsearch. It's not being worked on currently, so it may, be, uh, may, have, it may take some time for that to actually come uh, to the core. And then you have all the headaches of testing and debugging and, again, making sure everything ticks. And that's a big pain. So one final slide. Um, how you do that? So I know it's a bit small here, but uh, the idea is basically creating a plugin uh, class which derives from abstract plugin. And that class basically points to a lot of uh, um, different implementations that you can have for a plugin. So I, I would say the most basic one is a module. So you say, okay, here is a module. This module does this and that. It defines its own um, tools for Elasticsearch. And, ba and that once you have that module, you can just inject it to Elasticsearch using this plugin, uh, plugin class. That plugin class basically um, is being referred to by some embedded resource within the jar that tells it uh, where to um, bootstrap everything. There, uh, there are other uh, things that you can, uh, you can come up with. So transport actions or rest actions and all of those kind of stuff are basically just classes that you can easily find in the documentation. Just implement them and give, this, uh, give them your own uh, uh, implementations. We're pretty much out of time, so I will take one, two quick questions and uh, let you all go. Okay, great. Thanks uh, so, for taking questions. So, so j just a quick f feedback on the um, discovery plugins. Uh, I know you come from the .NET world. It, did you use the Azure uh, plugin, discovery plugin? Discovery you, on .NET. Uh, so it's the no the, the, the Azure? Azure Azure. Yeah. No, I haven't. Okay. I haven't tested so it's, it. it. You know, it, it no, I'm, no, I'm usually, I'm usually when I'm even more when I'm working with uh, 
Dot .NET clients, I usually just tell them use Linux to, for Elasticsearch. It feels much more natural for me to actually run Elasticsearch on, on Linux machines. And then, you know, development you can just do on .NET and connect to that. Great. Uh, any more questions? Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much again for your presentation. Thank you, guys. Uh